about to watch Plerud by Pastor Chumdi Ohahuna. As he brings to you a message from God's Word, that will build you up and make you complete in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus said in the book of John chapter 15 verse 8, Herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. We pray that as you watch this teaching you will receive the empowerment to bear much fruit in Christ. Now listen. So much time they went to Jesus. Why? Because we were talking about Jesus came to preach the gospel. And we understood that the gospel that Jesus came to preach is actually what? The gospel of the kingdom. We, we saw through scripture that Jesus went about saying the kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of God is at hand. And he told the disciples, God preach the kingdom of God. So Jesus actually came to preach one gospel and that's what? The kingdom of God. But we understood that the kingdom of God is about God's authority. And his authority is what? Is 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 is, is all also fully uploaded in Christ. Colossians chapter 1, chapter 2, verse 9. In him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So Jesus Christ is the full content of the Godhead. So the whole authority of every being is residing in Jesus. Amen. And when he was on earth, every being was walking the face of the earth. Praise God forevermore. So the kingdom of God is the revelation of Jesus. Amen. That's what the Bible says. Yeah, all authority have been given unto Jesus. Said, all authority have been given unto me. And then when I says, and I mention the name of just every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. So the authority of God is revealed in the person of Jesus. So when we receive Jesus, we have received the authority of God. Amen to Jesus. Praise the Lord forevermore. And that's what the kingdom of God is all about. So, and then we understand, we began to understand what the constituents of the kingdom of God entails, the preaching of the kingdom. What did he entail? And we saw in Isaiah chapter 61 and um, Luke chapter 4, verse 18 to 19, Isaiah chapter 61, verse 4. We saw that and we began to handle each of the constituents. Amen. And um, today we are handling the fifth one. Amen. And I believe that uh, with this one we should be able to uh, take a, a, a leap from the teaching of the kingdom of God and go back to the twelfth work that Jesus did. There are 31 that he came to do and we are just in the twelfth. So only God knows how long we'll see him on this. But he's not a silver person that he must cover in this period of time. So we'll keep teaching. And the beauty of all is that uh, as we teach, we have a survival. We diversify, amen. Remember when we teach on the Holy Spirit and we diversify and diversify the end of becoming a book of over 500 pages. Amen. And we pray God that this will also come up with his own book also. Two books, all right, it's going to be two books. So, yeah, the teaching on the Holy Spirit is two books. I was supposed to call the, the second one. This year in Jesus' name, see, there's so much more growth in us and we trust God for the grace to to bring out all the books that he has been given to us, amen to Jesus. And the reason why we write these books is because when the Lord teaches us, we have to put them down. God told the prophet, he said, write, write a vision, make it play Habakkuk, write a vision, make it play on top tables. You write a vision because there are people who may not be physically where you are, but they will need to read the vision. And there are people who prefer to read than to listen. I like people prefer to read than to listen or to watch the event. So by the grace of God, we are trying to make it available to everybody in both audio format, video format, written format. But doing the work that God is helping us to do. Because we know that in a very in a short space of time, this will form the foundational teachings of the ministry. Amen. Amen. Form the foundational teachings of the ministry. And I, I trust God for more grace to do more in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so but today we're going to be talking about recovery of sight to the blind. Recovery of sight to the blind. Recovery of sight to the blind. This is the fifth component of the kingdom of God which Jesus did and preached. And we'll study it. Amen. So we're looking at Luke chapter 4, verse 18 to 19. In Luke chapter 4, verse 18 to 19, Jesus read from Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1 to 3. Very important to know this that in that chapter, in that Luke's gospel 4, verse 18 to 19, Jesus was actually reading from Isaiah chapter 6 to 1, verse 1 to 3. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 6 to 1, verse 1 to 3. He said, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord had anointed me to preach the good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that poor. In three, he says, to appoint unto them 
that mourn in Zion to give unto them beautiful ashes and oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. This is Isaiah chapter 61, there's one to be. You see the red ring. This was actually what the Spirit of the Lord said about anointed Jesus to do. Amen. But let's look at the way Jesus really does in Luke chapter 4, verse 18 to 20. He said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon him because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Um, King James said, uh, Isaiah says, Glad good tidings. Good tidings are the gospel. The same thing. We study that. He says, He has sent me to heal the broken at um, And Isaiah says, To bind up the broken at To bind the wound is the same thing as healing the wound. Amen. Alright, it says to preach the deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and gave it to the minister and sat down. And all the eyes of and the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fasting on him. Go to the form is 80 to 20. Will this be glad for revelation into your world? Grant us insight in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And if you look at something, if you look at, I'm going to quickly touch on this and then I run away from it. If you look at um, Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1 to 3, in verse 2 it says to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. And he goes on to say to confront all that more. But it doesn't stop, stop at, it says acceptable year of the Lord, which is the year of the Lord's favor. We understood that in the year of the Lord's favor, which is the year of Jubilee. And it also has another thing here. And the day of what? The vengeance of our God. So why there is the acceptable year of the Lord? Amen. Which is the year of God's favor. There is also the day of vengeance of our God. Amen. That's what Isaiah states. But if you look at what Jesus did here in Luke chapter 4, look at um, Look at verse, um, verse 2. It says, To preach the acceptable year of the Lord. But, uh, verse 19, so it says, To preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And then verse 20 says, And he closed the book and gave it to the minister. So, what does it make us understand? That Jesus, when he read the book of Isaiah to the acceptable year of the Lord, he closed the book. He never talked about the day of the Lord's vengeance. Are we together? He only stopped at the acceptable year of the Lord. He never talked about the day of the Lord vengeance. As he got to the acceptable year of the Lord, the other verses, the other uh, 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 words were in the book. Are you getting me? But he didn't read them. Bible said he closed the book at the acceptable year of the Lord. What does that make us understand? If he closed the book at the acceptable year of the Lord, it means that it's the acceptable year of the Lord that the book is closed. In other words, the, the book of time, the book of destiny, the book of God's events and God's schedules and God's program for the earth and for humanity is closing up at the acceptable year of the Lord, not the day of the Lord's vengeance. And when Jesus closed the book, we have to close the book there. When we hear about coronavirus, we hear about this, we hear about that, we hear about new strains of this and that, that. we say, oh, God is judging the earth. The earth is under God's judgment. In other words, we are saying this is the day of the Lord's vengeance. But Jesus never declared the day of the Lord's vengeance. Why? Because we are still in the acceptable year of the Lord. No matter the matter, no matter the evils happening on the earth, we are still in the season of Jubilee. We are still in the acceptable year of the Lord. He closed the book there. And I don't know why, if Jesus closed the book, why Christians are opening the book. To read the day of the Lord's vengeance. If the, if the master, if Jesus himself, closed the book at the acceptable year of the Lord, where are we getting the day of the Lord's vengeance from? What card we have? Who gave us the power to open the book and start declaring the day of the Lord's vengeance? So I've got good news for you. Jesus closed the book at the acceptable year of the Lord. Yes. We close it there. Yes. The day of the Lord's vengeance is not yet come. And let me tell you something, do not come until the church is raptured. It don't come until the church is raptured. So there's no fear, there's no shaking. Forget all this pull up and lose and all this noise and all this drama and all this gymnastics. They are just noise. Remember what God told, you, told Moses, he told Moses, Pharaoh is but a noise. I'm a I remember when I saw that scripture many years ago, Pharaoh is but a noise. I was like, wow. Pharaoh is but a noise. And let me help you understand something, children of God. The coronavirus, all the the hula balloon, all the economic issues, all the the, the seemingly evils happening in the world today, they are 
of what? A noise. And a noise cannot take the place of what? And of a substance. The noise is the evils. The substance is the truth. Hallelujah. We are in the acceptable year of the Lord. And we have to close the book there. See, the reason why a lot of people are still scared is because they are opening the book that Jesus closed. Mm. Who gave me the right to open it and start to proclaim the day of the Lord with us? Are you the one to proclaim it? Were you the one who proclaimed it before? Why are you the one to proclaim it? Children of God, close the book. Is the acceptable year of the Lord. The devil can hit his head on the wall for all I care. He can go gather for all I care. He can run man for all I care. But all I know is that Jesus closed the book. Yes. It is the acceptable year of the Lord. The book was closed. That is what matters for now. What matters for now is what Jesus gave us. Amen. Any other thing does not matter for now. It's not important to us now. Because I will not be here when it's happening. Man. I will be raptured. The church of Jesus will be raptured. My family will be raptured by the grace of God. Yes. We will be raptured. So, what, what business do I have in the day of the Lord's vengeance? If for those who refuse Jesus, that they have business with me, but for me, what matters to me is what? The certain will of the Lord. That is why, even in this seemingly chaos and crisis, and economic crisis, and, and, social, and, and social evil, and uh, political. Tyranny everywhere and all the all the all the all the satanic agenda to destroy humanity to depopulate the earth that they did not create with all this drama they are doing we are seeing the second year of the Lord. Hallelujah. You know what? The Bible says that they shall come ahead and lost darkness in people. Man, it says, "But the light of the Lord shall shine on you." That is the second year of the Lord. So please, let's close the book there. Are we together? Let's talk about this plenty of talk of the day of the Lord Vengeance. It's not our business. Let's close the book on the acceptable year of the Lord. And let's enjoy this acceptable year of the Lord. Let's enjoy it. Enjoy it. Children of God, enjoy it. Problems are good because without problems, there will be no solution. And if you are not a solution to a problem, you cannot be wealthy. You cannot be recognized. And Bishop Peter also said, you only remember, you remember for two things, either the problem you solve or the problem you cost. Yeah. And for me, I'm told to solve problems, not to cause problems. So why should I be bringing the day of the Lord with them? If I'm bringing the day of the Lord with them, I'm causing a problem. All I have to do is to keep bringing the acceptable of the Lord. And that's what that matters to me. Children of God, let's enjoy the acceptable of the Lord. It's the year of the Lord's favor. It's a season, it means that for those who are not going to that teaching, you can't know, listen to it. And our life will be blessed in Jesus' name. So that's just a brief one. That's not what is important to the teaching for today. Amen to Jesus. But if you look at, at look at Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1 to 3, and look at the 14, 4, verse 18 to 20, you, 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 you discover that the recovery of sight of the blind was not in Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1. But it was in Luke chapter 4, verse 18. Amen. Amen. And Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1 is actually the text that Jesus read from. And this is King James translation, King James version, praise God. So it is more that recovering of sight was not in Isaiah 61 verse 1, but it was in Luke chapter 4 verse 18. Verse 18. And then accusations have been raised over the time. You know, there are people who just, all they do is to sit down and think of, and all they think of is how to um, fight the Bible. To fight the Bible. Many I remember I was watching something on, on the midnight and the lady was like, you see, I I I I I I got to the snapping castles, marching back with King John, and it looks like they're all contradictions to each other, they contradict each other, and what I say is different from what you say, and what you say is the one talks about the resurrection, and the one talks about the stop being one of me, but the one talks so he just contradictions. I want to ask him the complaint and the man who when she beat up the man said, You see, you are not ready to see phonologically. That's why you are saying they are contradiction. They don't contradict each other. See, study them when I didn't have to finish with you because I can't begin to make that study these things where you study they don't contradict each other. And uh, there are some, there's a program we don't watch that they go to Bible survey and they make us understand. People, people just want to say the Bible is a contradictory book. So they help them see how they are the most contradicting themselves, not the Bible contradicting itself. Amen to Jesus. Praise God for 
more. And someone who also be, um, um, also said that the New Testament it is quotes the Old Testament. I remember I was watching a particular movie. It was a true life movie about these Nazis and the Jews and every of that, you know. And the old Jewish man told the young Jewish guy, he told him, why do you need a New Testament when there is already an established Old Testament? So the old Jewish guy was a Judaic, the new Jewish, the old Jewish guy was um, a Christian. So why do you need a, a New Testament when there's already an established Old Testament? You know, and some of them believe that the New Testament misquotes the Old Testament. Some of them also believe that Christians are enemies in quote to Judaism. Some of them believe, you know, they, they've had many prepositions over the time and over the years. But see, that's the purpose of eschatology, that's the purpose of Bible surveys, so we can help us understand that the Old Testament is actually the revelation of the New Testament is actually the revelation of the Old Testament. Amen. Amen. The, old, the New Testament actually helps us understand the New Testament. The old, New Testament actually helps us understand the Old Testament in the fullness of its light. Amen. Amen. So it's not a misquoting, and that's also part of what, what we're going to understand today. So. Um, Jesus quotes the passage as containing a reference to giving signs to the blind. Now, but if you look up the, your, the, your King James Version, your English Version, you won't find any such reference. You will find receiving of sight in your English Version, the most the King James Version. Praise God for my Lord. Now, so, if, if you look at this in the first glance, it looks like it's an error. It looks like an error. And that's why I, I originally tell people, don't just pick King James and stand on you. You know that break your body if you're not careful. Amen. Amen. Don't pick in James and just stand on You see, a lot of people that argue don't bleed blindly because they pick in James and they don't. Some of them who don't claim that they have translated the Bible, they don't even go to the Bible. They don't even go th that far to translate. They just translate. Most of the translations that you see today, they are translations from Latin. Some of them are translations from Latin. And Latin was the first translation from the original Hebrew and Greek. Are you know what I'm saying? From that thing, now the King, King James now sent emissaries to go because there are so many issues. And he said, Come, we need this thing well table down. And he sent people to go and they translated the Bible from the Latin to, to old King James English. So some of them who claim that they have translated, they, they have translated from Latin. But this thing is bigger than Latin. Latin people have problems translating from original Hebrew and Aramaic. Praise God. Amen. But although we're not saying that we should go and start looking at the original Hebrew and Aramaic, but before you draw a conclusion, please go to the basics. Go to the basics. Many arguments we are having today in the Church of Jesus will be settled out if we actually go to historical concept, um, um, cultural concept of the Bible and the basics of the original text. We will, we will not have these arguments. Praise God forevermore. Now, um, the fact of the matter, however, is that there is no mistake or deception going on. Are you getting what I'm saying? Jesus simply cited an interpretive paraphrase familiar to his audience. Now, if you look at the verse there, the key, the key passage in, in uh, Isaiah chapter 1, 61 verse 1, and Luke chapter 4 verse 8, which we have read before. Is that not so? Now, so, and you see the clause, recovery of sight. But that clause is noticeably absent in the word in Isaiah chapter 61. It's absent in Isaiah chapter 61. So when did Jesus and Luke, the author of the book of Luke, where did they get this recovery of sight from? Amen. Amen. For us to get this answer, we have to go to the LXX and the New Testament. The LSX actually is the um, Septuagint. The Septuagint. Amen. Is the Greek rather than the Hebrew? Amen to Jesus. And the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. After the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, New Testament was written in Greek. Amen. But there is a Greek translation of the Hebrew. And that's what is called the Septuagint. It's LXX. LXX is Roman people. L is 15 also. X is 10. X is 10, that's 20, 50 plus 20. Amen to Jesus. It's called the LXX. Amen to Jesus. That's the Septuagint. So, how, what does the LXX read? What does the Septuagint read? Let's look at Isaiah 61, verse 1 in the Septuagint. Look at the Septuagint review. It says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim release to 
the captives and the recovery of sight to the blind. Do we see that there? Yes. So, what the King James omits in Isaiah 61, verse 1, the Septuagint has it. It was not an addition, that was the original red pill. Are you not saying? Yes. That's the original red pill. Now, let me not go into plenty talks about translation of the Bible. But that was the original red pill, and the Septuagint captured it. Praise the Lord for And so Jesus was talking to, um, to Hebrews, he was talking in the synagogue to Hebrews who were in a Roman environment. Are you getting what I'm saying? So, some of them, or if not all of them, though they were Hebrews, they might have had some Roman inclination. Are you getting me? So, for him to communicate appropriately to them, he has to use something that falls into the Hebrew and the Greek perfectly. And that's what the Septuagint James gives to you. But it's an original rendering that even some of the Dead Sea Scrolls did not provide. Are you getting what I'm saying? Yeah, you know the Bible. So this is some of the things that we need to get to understand very well. Now, if you look at the recovery of sight, it's present in this rendering. So this means that neither Jesus nor the nor the nor the author of Luke, that's Luke the physician, invented this phrase. It was already in a popular Jewish version of Isaiah from before the time of Christ. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You see, there was a Jewish version of the book of Isaiah that had this red dream, that had this face. It was already there. All the Septuagint did was to translate it from Hebrew to Greek. Are you hearing what I'm saying? That's what they did. And for that environment, it was a more suitable translation, the Septuagint. Because it was the Jews, but the Romans were they are rulers. Are we together? And it's obvious that some of the Romans were also worshipping in their synagogues. Remember uh, was the centurion where he said, when Jesus, when he came with his, with his daughter that was in the issue of his daughter that was sick, and what did he tell us? Please, attend me. He built a synagogue for us. If he built a synagogue, it also means that he must have been given no matter his busy schedule, he must have been coming once in a while to listen to their teachings and to worship with them. Are you know what I'm saying? So to make the 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 the, 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 the old testament that more presentable for both the Jews and in quote the Gentiles, the Romans, the Septuagint was brought in place. And it was a Greek translation of the original text. Of the Hebrew. Are we together? So the Septuagint is, is on, you can, you can get the Septuagint, it's, it's hard copy, there are hard copies of Septuagint, you also have soft copies, but uh, when I was trying to get the, some soft copies from the internet, I said the first one I clicked on, somebody, somebody commented on and said, this is not the original Septuagint, I didn't go for one. <laughs> because actually, this, uh, somebody says it's not the original Septuagint, some of them are scholars in this thing, amen. So they read Greek in details. So it was actually there in the original translation, one of the translations of the book of Isaiah. Also, all the central did was to lift it into the Greek. Amen to Jesus. Amen. All right. So Jesus was reading the scroll in front of him. Amen. Now such a scenario does not involve any error or deception on the part of Jesus or Luke. And it fits his it, it, and, and fits the historical context rather well. So he was reading the school because before him. You cannot read this, Jesus was not reading the school and then added to the school. We only said that, we only said that when he got to the assembly of the Lord, he closed it. Because he didn't want to add or subtract. So the best of the Lord close. But he didn't add or subtract to anything in the text. Praise the Lord forevermore. Alright, so Based on the LSX alone, the Septuagint, we can already conclude that this is not a flaw in the New Testament. It's not a flaw in the New Testament. Are we together? A, a Hebrew version similar to one from the Septuagint was also translated simply because that happened to be the version present at that particular synagogue. You see that? That was the, the version present at that particular synagogue. So if that was what he had to read. 
Amen to Jesus. Jesus did not have to come with his scroll from home to come and read. He read what was in the synagogue. He had not even, he was already reading what was in the synagogue and was already criticizing him. If he had created his scroll from home, then there should have been more problem. He told them, I didn't come to destroy the law. Yet they were still criticizing him. And we read that. So there was nothing misleading here. There was no misquoting. There was no error here. Praise the Lord, friend of all. So it's obvious that Jesus would have been reading from something like the Septuagint. Or far more likely, a Hebrew version similar to one from which the Septuagint was what? Translated. So the most likely one was that, is it that he was reading something like the Septuagint? Or a Hebrew version similar to what? The one, the, the, the root text from which the Septuagint was what? Translated. You see, these things, I, I remember once I was just talking on the internet and I was looking at the Dead Sea Scrolls and everything, I was like, wow, there's still so much to learn, so much to learn, so much to learn. The Dead Sea Scrolls, and, and if you look at it, the, it's also to make, to make to understand that one of the closest translations to the Dead Sea Scrolls is the ESV. In this standard version, that's one of the closest translations of the Dead Sea Scrolls because it was actually translated from directly from the Dead Sea Scrolls. But even in the Dead Sea Scrolls, there are scrolls and there are scrolls. <laughs> Praise God. Now, that's the reason why we say nobody should come and start giving that book because there are scrolls and we have seen that. We'll, we'll go for that, we'll see some things. Amen. Amen. There are schools and there are schools. And why is it like this? Because it is the glory of God. The book of Proverbs, the uh, book of Proverbs says, the glory of God to conceal a matter. And the honor of kings to do what? To search it out. God wants us to keep attaining kingship. That's why he makes us, he keeps concealing matters. So we can keep searching. The Bible says to his, to his wisdom, to the searching of his wisdom, there is no end. Eschatologists are still, escat they are still searching. Um, 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 I'm trying to remember the other name of people. They are still searching and researching and they are discovering more and more things. Why? Because till Jesus comes, till this death comes to an end, we will not be able to not search the, his wisdom to end. That's why he consumes matter. And that's the reason why you don't argue the Bible because the basis of which you are arguing may just be an old school revelation that will soon, you will soon see something that will make you know that there's something that you don't know yet. We know in parts, we see us in glass. So we all we need to do is our focus needs to be on the perfection of Jesus. Are you getting what I'm saying? The only way to receive the word of God is to receive it as God's word. Without any argument as to whether the word of God is perfect or not. You receive it as God's word and you receive it as a perfect word. Are you getting what I'm saying? Somebody said once or something, I said, this Bible is not men that they say those it. I say yes, they were men inspired of God. They were not just men, they were men inspired of God. Until you receive the word of God as God's inspiration, you will keep seeing it as a book written by men. And you will never get the best out of it. The best way to receive the word of God is to receive it as well. The word of God. God's inspiration. God's breath on men's pains. Once you receive it in that light, then you can grow in revelation. But if you don't receive it in that light, you will keep growing in confusion. And that's what brings about vain argument, vain baptisms, and vain religions. And heresy at the end of the day. Yes. And are we together? Yes. Amen. Alright, so although this does not leave us with another question, this does this leaves us with another question. Why does the Septuagint contain this clause? Where did this understanding of Isaiah chapter 61 come from? The answer is fascinating. And again, fits well with the historical narrative in Luke chapter 4, verse Luke chapter 4. The Dead Sea Scrolls contain multiple copies of Isaiah. You see that? They contain what? Multiple copies, copies of Isaiah. Among them, we find a Hebrew version of Isaiah chapter 61. That instead of freedom to prisoners, you see, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, you have multiple copies of Isaiah. So there were, there were also, even in the Hebrew, there were also translations and translations. Are you getting it? Because I don't want to go through some things um, um, that so we will not talk too much. But we must understand that this has to do with. Language. Are you getting it? Language. Language and grammar. 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 Amen. Now, if you see there's a translation in, 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 in the Hebrew, which instead of using the word freedom to prisoners, 
it refers instead to what? The release from darkness or opening the eyes of the prisoners. You see that? This is all grammatical construction. They are saying the same thing but with different grammatical presentations. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Like in English, you have what they call uh, hyperbole, simile, metaphor, and the likes. You are just trying to say something, but you are using um, an idiomatic expression to say it. Are you getting what I'm saying? Now, so this is what this entails. It is the same thing they are trying to say, but they use different idiomatic expressions to say it. And like in you know, some other time, you use what they call proverbs to do what? To say it. This version does not appear to have been limited in the Qumran community. See, that's the community. Amen. It also appears to have been what? The letter to the Quran community. The later Aramaic translation on, on the Targum of Isaiah states similarly that those who are bound will be revealed to light. Praise the Lord for the Lord. You see, the later translation of Isaiah, the Aramaic translation, actually says those who are bound will be revealed to light. Look at what another translation says, instead of saying freedom to prisoners, it actually says what? The release from darkness or opening the eyes of the prisoners. Now, what does this bring to mind? It brings to mind prisoners in a dungeon. And you know in dungeons, when prisoners are kept in dungeons, there is actually no light. <laughs> actually, some of them can get blind due to being in the dungeon. Are you getting it? Because when light rays does not enter the eye for a period of time, it leads to blindness. So it's talking about not just ordinary prisoners, not the ones that are just stay in the cell, or the ones that say in, in the beautiful cells in some of the Western world. No, I'm talking about prisoners that have been in this world, having prisoners that they cannot afford to put them in cells, they have to put them in, in dungeons where there is no light. They pass food to them. Some of those dungeons are underground dungeons, they are in caves. They pass food to them and bring the food out. They don't, nobody has contact with them. So in other words, they are actually living in darkness. The dungeon is dark. Everything about them is dark. Their life is dark. They may end up being blind if their, if their cornea is not strong enough. So such kind of prisoner, what he desires the most is not just liberty. What he desires the most is light. Because light can become scarce to such a prisoner. So one translation talks about it, freedom to prisoners. Another one talks about it was, it, it renders it this way, the release from darkness, because they are in darkness. Or it also put it like it's opening the eyes of the prisoners. Praise God for the Lord. Hallelujah. And similarly, it means to those who are bound, will be revealed what? To light. 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 Because they are being has kept them in darkness. The warnings who refer to the prisoners locked up in a dark dungeon and then set free to come out into light. But it would also be understood to describe the literal opening of the blind eyes as seen in the Septuagint translators. Praise God for your Lord. But whatever the case may be, we discover that the issue, the point of contention, the major cause of the matter is what? Light. Light. Because the when somebody is blind, he cannot see light. Is that not so? A person is said to see when he can start seeing light. The moment the person stops seeing light, he has become blind. So a person in a dungeon that will not see light is, let me say, literally blind. It only takes some time and he will become, even if he was not blind before he entered that dungeon, it only takes some time he will become blind. Because the cornea will lock up, it has not seen, it has not seen light to function. So long as it doesn't see light to function, what happens? It has to shut down. So the issue here, the cross of the matter here, is not about the prisoners. Are we together? Neither is it about the blind eyes. The cross of the matter here is about light. Recovering of sight is recovering of light. Giving of sight is giving of light. The eyes processes light to be able to give sight. Light hits the cornea and then when it hits it, it rebounds back and then it can get sight. So when light is not hitting the cornea, then there is no sight. So the cross of the matter here 
is what? Light. And so whether it was the prisoners in the dungeon or the blind see, the problem remains is their light. So whichever the red view was, the issue remains what? Light. Yes, Jesus said the coming of sight, and he read from the L, most probably the LMX, the LSX, sorry, the Septuagint, which must have been a, the, what he had read for all a translation close to the Septuagint, praise God, which was what, one of the red rings of the Hebrew. That is actually what he read from. But the major thing that focuses, we focus on here is light. Amen. Amen. Praise God forevermore. So, the, if you look at um, one of the Dead Sea Scrolls, known as the Mosaic Mesaic Apocalypse, it combines Isaiah 61 verse 1 with the miracle of giving sight to the blind and takes it to be a Mesaic prophecy. We'll go into this. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It combines Isaiah 61 verse 1 with the miracle of giving sight to the blind and it takes it to be what? A Mesaic prophecy. Now, the, this interpretation may have also been reinforced by similarities between Isaiah 61 and Isaiah 42. Just as Isaiah 61 be, begins, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me to bring, to bring good news to, to the afflicted. Isaiah 42 begins like this Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen one, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nation. Now, if you look further in a few verses, in Isaiah 2, 42, verse 7, it says, To open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the dungeon. You see, you see Isaiah, Isaiah 42, verse 7, makes a, a very close relationship and is a cross reference to Isaiah 2, verse 1, verse 1. Isaiah 2, verse 1, according to the, or, uh, the Septuagint, or uh, one of the Dead Sea Scrolls renderings of the uh, of the Hebrew, Amen. It talks about opening this recovery of sight to the blind. And but Isaiah chapter 42 verse 7 goes further to tell us to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the dungeon. So these two, we are talking about opening blind eyes and bringing out prisoners. That's what we want. Like now in verse, verse 7 and chapter, he lumps up his talking together. So if you are complaining about Isaiah 61, I said talking about respect of blind eyes. Now we give you both opening of blind eyes and what bringing out prisoners from the dungeon. And those who dwell in darkness from the prison. You see that? Open blind eyes, bring out prisoners from the dungeon, and those who dwell in darkness from the prison. So there was a major emphasis of darkness here. Why? Because darkness is what? The absence of light. And when there is consistent and perpetual darkness, blindness is assured. A lot of population is blind. Why? Because darkness is covering the net. Lack of population is blind. Sometimes I just sit down and I groan in my spirit and I'm like, God, this darkness is so much. This blindness is so much. It's so much. And sometimes you see Christian folks even suffering from that blindness. And sometimes I say, God, why is it that God is one thinking me? I'm thinking. But it's not. In a very similar context, opening of blind eyes is directly connected to liberation of prisoners. You see that? It's connected to what? Liberation of prisoners. So this makes us understand that blind, the opening of blind eyes, when the Bible talks about it, it's also connected to liberation of prisoners. So in other words, when the Bible talks about opening of blind eyes, it also can infer what? Liberation of prisoners. Is an idiomatic expression to talk about what? Liberation of what? Prisoners. That have been locked up in a dungeon. Praise God forevermore. Hallelujah to Jesus. So the release of that, the release from darkness, the opening of blind eyes, and are all synonymous. They all kind of mean the same thing. Opening of blind eyes, release from darkness, release from dungeon, release from prison, they are all talking about the same thing. It's all about what? Producing light. Praise the Lord for your Lord. Amen. Amen. Furthermore, we must understand that the miracle of recovering of sight to the blind, that is the blind sin, never happened all through the Old Testament. You must understand this. It never happened all through what? The Old Testament. You see, so 
These things were prophetic declarations of what was to happen in the future. Amen to Jesus. Now, go to the Old Testament. You see the dead body was raised. You see uh, uh, other miracles that happened. You see the lep uh, uh, the leper. What was his name again? Naaman was cleansed. What did what did Jesus cleanse them? But in the Old Testament, they cleansed them. Huh? Then we raised. Praise God. The sick were healed. But the only recovering of sight it never happened in the Old Testament. In other words, once darkness comes in the Old Testament, it is darkness forever. No light and we are to Jesus. Now, this also makes us understand the reason for the dark ages, the 400 years when God never spoke to man, 400 years of God's silence to score the dark ages. It, it, it was just a physical show of the fact that there was no light in the Old Testament. There was no recovery of sight in the Old Testament. That's why we say the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. Praise the Lord for all. It's the light of the New Testament concealed. And the New Testament is the light of the Old Testament revealed. So there was no opening of eyes in the Old Testament. Amen to Jesus. This miracle happened only in the New Testament. And Jesus was the one who brought it to humanity. Thus, he was the first person to perform this miracle. Blind Artemis was a case of how sight was restored. His sight was restored. Oh, he cried unto the Lord and said, Lord, Jesus, that son of David, have mercy on me. He said, What will you have me do for you? So that I may receive my sight. Oh, beautiful. And they prayed for him and he received his sight. Oh, some two blind men were walking and they said, Lord, give that sight. And Jesus gave that. So he restoring of sight of Jesus was just a normal, sweet occurrence that he kept doing. Oh, another man was blind by the pool and he mixed his saliva with his soul, with, the, with the earth and he, and he covered the man's eye and told him, Go well, and wash your pool, your, 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 your eyes in the pool and the man washed his eyes and that was it and the man was it and another one that he healed when he healed that one he said how do you see the man said I see men like trees and he prayed for him again and he began to see men like men the recovering of sight was something that Jesus frequently gave to humanity why because it was what he came to do it was not an old testament act it was a new testament act and only Jesus came to do that. He performed that miracle the first time, and only he performed the miracle, only he initiated that miracle. It was after he initiated it that his disciples started initiating it. Praise God for all. The reason for this is that the miracle of recovering of sight was beyond physical happening. Are you getting what I'm saying? Now, if the miracle of recovering of sight was just a, let me say what, a physical happening, it should have happened in the Old Testament. Raising of the dead was God's intervention in the, in the operations of men. Raising of the dead was the supernatural happening in the physical. Is that not so? Yes. So it happened. That means it was, it was just, it was, the, it was the miracle of the physical coming back to life. It happened. Are you getting me? Raising of the leper was a miracle also. It happened. But the miracle of receiving of sight was beyond, let me use the word, every other miracle. Let me tell you something in other words. The miracle of receiving of sight is the greatest miracle. The greatest miracle. Why? We learned that it's a prophet. It was in line with prophecy as touching the Messiah. So that miracle was excluded for only the Messiah to begin. <laughs> yeah. Could be done by prophets, but this miracle was specific for only the Messiah to initiate. And raise the dead. Elijah cleansed the leper, uh, healed the leper. They man go deep in the Jordan River seven times and he be cleansed. Jesus, Jesus raised the dead. Yes, was. Jesus cleansed the leper. So what's the big deal? What's the difference between Elijah and Jesus? What's the difference between Elijah and Jesus? The difference is opening the blind eyes. <laughs> That's the difference. That's the difference. Oh, Elisha was with the sons of the prophet, and he told them, "Oh, oh, oh they, 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 let's go and get um, let's go." And, they said, "Let's go build another um, another um, um, hostel for us." And they began to build, and they said, okay, one of them went into the, into the field, and he collected some herbs. And when he collected the herbs, they began to cook them, and as they began to eat, they, 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 the prophet, they, they, one of the prophets said, "Oh." Alas, master, there is death in the pot. Ah, and he said, There is death in the pot. Wow, what was the problem? The help they got was a very dangerous said that when you eat it, you will pull and pull till the best, the best will pull and pull till he dies. And then at the end of the day, he solved the whole problem and they, they did not die. God. There were healings in the water, and there was every other miracle, every other miracle in the water. 
Testament. But the opening of blind eyes never occurred in the New Testament. That is what made the Messiah different from the prophets. So when they call Jesus the prophet, in triumphant entry, when Jesus was entering, they said, oh, who is this man that is entering? Somebody said, he's the prophet called Jesus. No, they called him a prophet. Beautiful, but he was not a prophet. He was the Messiah, different from every other prophet. Every other prophet, they, 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 they heal the, they, 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 they raise the dead, they heal the sick. Oh, today, somebody raises his dead. Is he not a major prophet? He's a major prophet. He's a big prophet. Don't I not say, major prophet is, I'm not raising that. I'm not entering his dead. Like, come on. They, 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 they heal the, the, the lepros, they, they, they did all that miracles. But what differentiated Jesus from them is what? Recovering of sight. That's what differentiates the Messiah from the prophets. Praise God. Hallelujah. And the reason for this is that the miracle of the coming of Sarah beyond the physical happening, it was a spiritual act which had a prophetic significance to the purpose and the role of the Messiah to the world. Are you getting what I'm saying? It had a spiritual significance of what? To the purpose and the role of the Messiah to the world. Spiritual significance. So it was not just a mere act. Are you getting what I'm saying? It was not just a mere act. It was not just a miracle. It was not just a miracle. The opening of blind eyes was the miracle that would turn the tide of life around forever. And so it was very important. The opening of blind eyes, therefore, was a prophetic indication that the world which was in darkness has seen light. It was a prophetic indi indication that the world which was what? In darkness and the world has seen light. So for every blind eye opened by Jesus, he communicated this message to them. So every time Jesus opened the blind eye, he was telling them, the world has seen light. The world has seen light. The world has seen light. That's what he was communicating to them every time he opened the blind eyes. By this, Jesus fulfilled the prophecy in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2. And what is that prophecy? The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them had the light shadow. This was a prophecy that was given. The people that dwelt in darkness have seen a great light. And how did this prophecy manifest? It will only manifest when the one who gives light comes. And how can he give light? Is by what? Restoring sight. Removing brightness. So the act of restoring sight is actually the act of removing darkness. The act of restoring sight is the act of what? Removing darkness and blindness. And darkness, sorry. When darkness is removed, light is brought in and sight is restored. So the coming of Jesus was the coming of, that's what I'm saying, the light shined in the darkness and the darkness comprehended it. But what comprehended it really means the darkness cannot hold it. The darkness cannot hold it. It's not possible for it to be held. The problem with the world is darkness. And only light can expel darkness. Yes. Only the presence of light can give, can make darkness take flight. So what makes a man blind is not that he doesn't see. What makes a man blind is that he doesn't see light. Mm. <laughs> that means your eyes can be wide open, but you are still blind. There are some people who their eyes are open, but they are still blind. The problem is light. So that means even if you are in the midst of light and you don't see light, you can still be blind. The world was covered with light. That's why in Genesis chapter one, verse one said, uh, uh, in verse, verse two, Genesis chapter one, in the beginning, one, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And so that the earth was without form and and. And, and, that, and, 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 that, and darkness covered the face of the earth. You see, there's two things also that I told you. That form and void, and what? Darkness, darkness, darkness. The issue again, darkness covered the face of the earth. What was the solution to darkness? Verse 3. And God said, let there be light. So what happened in Genesis chapter 1 verse 3 is what repeated itself in John chapter 3 verse 16 and in Matthew when Jesus came to earth. 
darkness symbolizes sin and its effects. As seen in Isaiah chapter 16, verse 2 it says, For behold, the darkness, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness, the people, the people, the people. Now, the reason why the darkness covers the earth is because the people are covering the earth. Are you understand something? Because the people are born in it. Look at the earth. Look at the world today. It's all about gross darkness of the people. You begin to wonder why people cannot think straight again in line with God's will. It's all, it's, it has become weird to live for Jesus. It has become weird to live holy and righteous. It has become, it has become old school to live in sanctity, to live in, 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 in righteousness. It's an old school is stealing, lying, cheating, corruption is everywhere. It is that become the norm the society. That is what is called the gross darkness. Somebody said something a while ago. He said, we have the kind of leaders we have because of the kind of people we are. So you don't complain about your leader. Check yourself. Check yourself. Before you complain about the leaders you have, check yourself. Gross darkness covering the people. And the gross darkness here is all about sin. It speaks of sin and its events. The word sin is from the Hebrew word Hosek. And Hosek means darkness, obscurity. It means the secret places. It means misery, destruction, death, ignorance, sorrow, wickedness, obscurity. And, and is it not all that defines sin? Misery, destruction, death, look at it everywhere. Uh, uh, ignorance, sorrow, wickedness. That's the definition of sin. And that's what is covering the people. The gross darkness covering the people. That's what is covering the people. Before Jesus came, the gross darkness was covering the people. Are you what I'm saying? So when Jesus came, he came to show them that light has come. And that's why he kept on opening blind eyes. He was not showing up that he can open blind eyes. Jesus would have done any other, every other man would have left the blind eyes blind, just like it happened in the Old Testament. Are you what I'm saying? He would have still be celebrated as a, as a great prophet. Are you, are you what I'm saying? But what differentiated Jesus? From the prophets where the blind eyes he opened. What made him, he said, let me do what? The crowning of him as the Messiah was the blind eyes he opened. Because if he had just healed the sick, raised the dead, and caused the leg to walk, and every other man would not have opened up blind eyes, he would have not been differentiated from every other prophet. Are you getting what I'm saying? The opening of blind eyes was a prophetic indignation that light has come. Light, on the other hand, symbolizes salvation and all it entails. As told us in Isaiah 62, verse 3, it says, And the Gentiles shall come to thy light. The word light here in the Hebrew is the word or. And or means light, light of day, light of the heavenly luminaries, which are the moon, sun, and stars. It means the daybreak, it means the morning light, it means light of life, light of the lamp, it means light of prosperity. It means light of instruction, it means light of the face, and it also means Jehovah as Israel's light. This actually entails what? Salvation. Is that also? Is that also? So why darkness entails sin? Light entails what? Salvation. So this means that light of Israel whom the Gentiles will come to is Yeshua and Mashiach. That's the person of Jesus. Now, we have been, we have been this, we're, we're watching a, 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 a television show, understanding that gradually the, 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 the Jews are beginning to come to understand that the, the, their Messiah has actually come. And they must return back to him as spoken in Romans chapter 13. Praise the Lord forevermore. The miracle of recovering of sight was absent in the Old Testament because only Jesus saves. And there was no salvation in the Old Testament because the blood of Jesus, which enacts and seals the new covenant, was not yet shed. Thus, only Jesus gives and brings light. Acts chapter 4, verse 10 to 11 says, Be it known unto you and all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye 
see crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him, does this man stand here before you? Neither is there salvation in any other. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under the heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Only Jesus gives salvation. That is the reason why Jesus was the first person to open the blind eyes. Because only he gives what? Salvation. So the opening of blind eyes or the recovery of sight is more than an act. It is a prophetic indi in indication of salvation. Are you getting what I'm saying? It's a pro the prophetic indication of what? Of salvation. That's why Jesus, at every opportunity he had to open the blind eyes, he quickly opened it. Because when he was trying to tell them, salvation is here, salvation is here, salvation is here, salvation is here. Darkness has left his eye. If darkness can leave this eye, that means darkness can leave another eye. If darkness can leave another eye, that means darkness can leave another eye. And if darkness can leave another eye, that means in all this time, that darkness will leave many, 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 many eyes. And that's what Jesus came to do, to remove darkness from the eyes of many, that they may see light. For every blind eye Jesus opened, it was a prophetic indignation, demonstration, and pointer that salvation was now with man. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. It says, And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplications. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And they shall mourn for him as one mourned for his only son. And shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for the firstborn. This is the reason why the house of David will look upon Jesus, who they killed in their bitterness, because their blind eyes will be open. That their blind eyes will be open. He said that we pour upon them the spirit of God, upon the house of David, and they have the spirit of God, grace and supplication, and they shall look upon him who they are pierced. See, there is an outpouring of the spirit of grace and supplication upon the house of David, the Jews. It's coming, it's coming heavy. It's coming heavy. Because they pierced him and they didn't know. But let me tell you something. When they return back and they, they look upon him with the pierce, I tell you, there is greater joy for us, the Gentiles. Yeah. There's greater joy for us. There's greater joy. Yeah. So God is pouring out the spirit. Why? So their eyes will be opened. And I tell you something. See, we have a window time. The Gentiles, we have a window time. To be able to spread this light to the ends of the earth. Because our time will soon be elapsing, and the time for the, the for the house of David, for their eyes to be open, we come up. Are we together? So in this time we have, we have to spread this light. Are you getting what I'm saying? Preaching the glorious gospel of Jesus is the power of God to open the blind minds of men. This is why the devil tries to prevent it at all costs. Look at 2 Corinthians 3, verse 4, verse 3 to 4. It says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world had blinded the minds of them which believe not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine upon them. The devil finds the preaching of the gospel of Jesus. He makes the church, he, 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 he is happy when the church preaches every other thing. We can preach every other thing, but not Jesus. He is happy when that happens because the moment Jesus becomes our message, the blind eyes will receive sight. Darkness will leave them and light will come. So he fights it. He fights it. He fights it. He fights it. And that's why the more he fights it, the more we preach it. I remember a while ago I asked him, Lord, speak to me. What do you want me to do now? What do you want me to do at this point? I am doing, I am doing, what do you want me to do? And I, I was sleeping and I heard a verse of scripture. I can't remember it precisely. And the summary of everything was, is about the words, and I said, we preach boldly. The gospel of the Lord just we preach boldly. And I and I and I understood what the Lord was trying to tell me. The Lord was trying to keep, it was telling me, keep preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus boldly. Boldly. No matter the things you see.
see happening around you. Keep preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus. Boldly. Boldly. Why? Because all these things you are seeing around you, they are the devil's reactions to the gospel of Jesus. Are you getting what I'm saying? When you preach every other thing, the devil is comfortable. When you preach motivation, when you preach money, when you preach in quote comfort, when you preach God will bless you, the devil is excited and the people are excited. They are happy. That's what they want to hear. But when your focus becomes Jesus and Jesus alone, they get itchy. Why? Because the devil knows that the moment they know Jesus, they are dark, this darkness will leave their eyes. Are you getting me? And the light of Jesus will come to them. And the things that they are pursuing will start pursuing them. Why do I have to preach the song, the, 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 the shadow, where the substance is there? Are you getting what I'm saying? Why do I have to preach the branch where the root is there? Jesus is called the root of David. Why do I have to preach David when Jesus is there? Why do I have to preach the, 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 the caricature when the real thing is there? When Jesus becomes the focus of our messages, the things that we are craving after, the miracle signs and wonders, they will follow us, we will follow after them. But the devil has kept us in a rat race and has kept us in a cyclical chase of pursuing the shadows instead of going after the substance. Jesus came to recover sight because his major role as a Messiah was to do what? Was to recover sight. He came to bring light to expel darkness. That is what Jesus came to do. And by opening every blind eye he opened, he was telling them, light has come. Salvation has come. The glorious light of salvation has come. And Jesus went to the cross, we are the lights of the world. In other words, we are the glorious extension of salvation. We are the extension of salvation to humanity. Wherever we enter into, we must extend God's salvation power to humanity. In your place of work, in the marketplace, in the business place, wherever you must extend God's salvation power to humanity. I remember talking with a taxi driver who picked me up once, and as I was talking with him, he told me, oh, he has, he has a program of people from my country, and I was like, ah, but he told me, then he went straight and told me, he said, you, you are a different one. He told me, problem, I said, you, you are a different one. You are one of the good ones. He said, I've seen a lot of bad ones, but you, you are one of the good ones. He told me, straight up, you are one of the good ones. He said, and I said, why this is, he told me, this is the way, this is the way most of them behave. But you, you didn't behave like this. You, you are one of the good ones. You must be the extension of what? God's glorious light of salvation to humanity. Are you getting what I'm saying today? The light of Jesus is our light. And Jesus opened the blind eyes as a, as a prophetic sign to make the world know that salvation is here. Our duty is to keep opening blind eyes. That's why we preach the gospel. That's how we preach Jesus. Whether they like it or not, we preach it. Whether they like us or not, we preach it. Jesus told us that they don't like us because they didn't like him. But whether they like us or not, whether they like the Lord, we preach Jesus. Why? Because they may not be, they may not accept that light today. But someday they will realize that this light was what they did that said years ago that would have made the light better. I remember what my parents used to tell me, he said, there was a particular friend of theirs, why they were, why they were in the previous state where they were before they moved to the, to the state where they are. When my parents got born again, they kept on telling this man, they told tell him about Jesus, preaching to him, and this guy did not see, the darkness was so gross on him, on him that he could not see the glorious light we were talking about. Years after, he saw the glorious light of Jesus. His eyes were open. The eyes of his mind were open. And he received Jesus as his Lord and personal Savior. And you know what he told my parents? He said, why didn't you tell me that Jesus is this sweet? And they say, how many you want us to have told you that Jesus is sweet? That's why we are preaching. Are you getting what I'm saying? That's why we are preaching Jesus. Because some people today we are preaching, you know, the, the darkness of their eyes will still be strong. But we are preaching. Why are we preaching? Because not that two years from now, not that three years from now, they may not call me and say, Pastor, why didn't you tell me that this thing they say was this good? But in their heart, they will say, Oh, if I knew, I should have obeyed, I should have 
I should have accepted this life two years ago. I should have been better than where I am today. Yes. But another five years from now, some of them, their eyes will be open and the darkness will be expelled from their eyes. That's why we are preaching. Yes. We are preaching Jesus because we want the salvation power of God, the light of the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus, to penetrate every dark eyes and dispel darkness. Rise up with your feet. This, this, this message is actually a message for intercession. It's a message for intercession. And we're going to be interceding today for every one individual in darkness. Father, let the light of your gospel, let the light of Jesus penetrate their minds and dispel, expel, and cast out every darkness in their mind. Let's open the mouth and pray for them. You know you want to make Jesus your Lord and personal Savior. You can say this prayer after me. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, today I acknowledge and I have been living in God's darkness. I have been in the dungeon of sin. I have been a prisoner of sin. And I have been in darkness. Lord, with this understanding, I ask you to come into my heart. Bring the light of your salvation to my heart. I receive you as my Lord and personal Savior. I choose to follow you all the days of my life. I live in your light. Thank you, Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray for everyone person who has said this prayer. I pray for the grace to keep following you and living in your light. Let it be made and available to them in the name of Jesus. They shall not be true, they shall not be swept away by vain babies. They shall not be swept away by the cares of this world. They shall not be swept away by, 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 by different frustrations and everything that takes you away from the faith. Lord, I pray that they be deeply rooted in you. Thank you, Lord and King, in the name of the Lord Jesus. I want to pray for everyone present under the sound of my voice. And in one area of your life or the other, you'll be experiencing darkness. That side has been so gloomy and dark, and it looks like there is no way out in that area. I speak the salvation power of Jesus, the light of the glorious gospel into that area of your life. For that kind of person that in your family, your, in, your, in, your, in your marriage, there has been this three years of crisis, crisis, crisis that you cannot escape. You've done everything to try to end this challenge, but it never ends. You have, you, have, you have gone for counseling, you have even gone for counseling in church, you have gone for counseling with a, with a, with a, with a secular counselor, you've, you've, you've done everything, you've tried to talk with each other, you try different approaches to make this thing work, but it's not working. There's a call for darkness that is separating both of you. I said the husband and the wife, the call for darkness separating both of you. You can't just meet, it's just there. Malin Zodaba, Shanda Barada. I speak the glorious gospel of Jesus. I speak the revelation of Jesus. I speak the light of Jesus into your relationship. And I command that darkness is dispelled in the name of Jesus. That darkness is casted out in the name of Jesus. I decree and declare now, let light spring forth in your heart. Let right understanding of each one that spring forth in your heart. In the name of Lord Jesus. Thank you Lord for doing this in the name of Jesus. I pray for that person. Who you, 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 you experience one, one, one part of your face, and that part of your face, it look one, one, one side is like it's, it's, it's dead, and the other side is alive. Just your face, one side is dead, and the other side is alive. I decree, but no sit about the healing power of Jesus runs into your face now, and I command life back into that face in the name of the Lord Jesus. I command life back into that face in the name of Jesus. I see somebody, you, you, you've been experiencing, you've been having seizures, seizures. Seizures for years, actually 15 years. You have, you have, you have, you have tried every possible to see an end to it, but it doesn't come. I decree the power of Jesus rest upon you now and brings an end to the seizures in the name of the Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, I decree your healing power upon everyone, and I pray for everyone who is still in doubt about their salvation. Let the glorious gospel of Jesus be revealed to them. Christ be revealed to them. And let the light shine forth in the darkness. No more darkness in the name of the Lord Jesus. We believe you have been blessed watching and listening to this teaching. We invite you to watch and listen to more Pluru teachings by Pastor Chumdi Ohahuna. You can subscribe and watch our YouTube channel for more videos of these series and other series. Or listen via Grace Life Podcast on Anchor FM. We would like to hear from you via email, 
if you made the prayer of salvation and would like to share your testimonies from this ministration. Grace to you.